Good afternoon. Welcome to this hybrid policy exchange event on Britain's place in the world. Um, I'm Shashank Joshi. I'm Defence Editor at The Economist. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you all uh, to a fantastic panel of um, uh, very high powered guests who will talk us through some of these issues. Um, this is obviously a, a key time to be considering all of this. Uh, the UK's relationship with Europe uh, in some ways hangs in the balance. Uh, we are weeks away from an American election in which the future of American power and transatlantic relations are both in some ways at stake. Uh, China is asserting itself uh, across Asia and in Europe. Um, the first China-India clashes in, in decades um, and a, a brutal crackdown in Hong Kong. Uh, all of it in ways that I think are, are reshaping British perceptions of Chinese power and, and the meaning of that for our own defence and security policy. Amid all of those changes abroad, the government is undertaking, I think, what we're all familiar with, uh, an integrated review, a review of foreign defence, security and aid policy in the round. And in the past few weeks, I think we have seen some uh, tantalising hints of what that review will yield. Last week, we had the UK Armed Forces launch their new integrated operating concept um, about the uh, relating to the way that they thought future wars would be fought and the way that the UK would have to be prepared to fight them. And we've already seen indications of uh, a fairly uh, radical shift in the uh, shape and purpose of the armed forces. Um, we have a fantastic panel to talk us through all of this. I think it makes the most sense for us to begin with Tom Tugendhat, who, of course, is chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee and also a former army officer. Tom, um, please kick us off with five minutes. But if I could just uh, say, uh, just steer you for a, for a second. Um, one of the phrases that we have been hearing um, in the last few weeks is that the review will uh, prioritise the UK as a, quote, burden sharing and problem solving country. Does that mean anything to you? What does it mean in practice? Is it is it is it uh, is it jargon? Is it a meaningful set of principles? And um, presumably, you've you've been briefed and consulted on the review. How do you see it proceeding? And, and what are your concerns? What are your hopes? Thank you, Tom. Sure, Shank. Look, it's uh, thank you very much indeed for the introduction, and uh, thank you very much to the other panelists. As ever with uh, reviews that Whitehall has generated, uh, they have certain buzzwords, certain code words that mean something to insiders and very often mean nothing to outsiders. And the point about the burden sharing that is brought up is actually this is the fundamental point about British foreign policy into the future. Now, whether Trump wins again, whether Biden wins for the first time, whatever happens with China's changes, whatever happens in India, and depending on what happens really around the world, this policy applies. And it applies for a very simple reason. The reality is that the world has changed over the last five years, not just Brexit, not just Trump. It has fundamentally changed because the hegemony of two major powers is shifting. And they are, of course, the United States and China. And our relationship between them as, if you'll excuse the expression, others, non-hegemonic powers, us, France, Japan, India, Australia, Canada, and many, many more, is that actually, for the first time in generations, if we want to defend the international rules-based system, if we want to defend that loose pattern, that network of alliances, of treaties, of agreements, and frankly, just of culture, that has kept us prosperous and safe for most of the last seven decades, then it's now on us. It's really on us, in a way that it hasn't been quite so much before. Look, on one side, we know, since Obama, in fact, since Bush, in some ways, the United States has been moving away from being the only global hegemon, from being the guarantor. And on the other side, China is challenging the various different balances that have really kept us in place. So for those of us, us and Japan are two obvious ones, but actually for members of the European Union, South American and some African states as well, if we want to keep this together, it's on us. Now, this is where Britain's role comes in. This is the fundamental bit about British diplomacy. There is a reason why we have more diplomatic missions than almost anybody else in the world. There's a reason why we invest so much in global rule of law and in international organizations. It's so that we can not govern, not run, but enable 
so many different frameworks. And that's why you'll have heard me speaking, Shawshank, I know, at various other events about different plurilateral organizations. The idea that instead of having simply a UN, a NATO, perhaps a World Health Organization as a fixed entity, that in some parts what you actually want is you want more flexible entities. Maybe you want 70 or 80 countries who can work together on the environment, an E80. Maybe you want 30 or 40 countries who can work together on trade, a T50. Maybe you want some who can work together on democratic participation in the UN. There are a whole series of areas that we need to think about. Now, there are examples of where we can draw on. And the initial example to draw on is what our predecessors did with the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade in the 1940s. What they did then was they came up with a series of small, often small steps, to defend, to build up, to create a network that ended up in the WTO, that ended up in the appellate bodies and various other different examples of global trade. Now, I don't think that's where we should be looking to start, but if we look at where the gap started and what it was started to do, which was to defend the free countries against the then Soviet empire, you can see how these free alliances defending us all, holding this international organization together, holding this cooperation and partnership, this agreement, this debate, this democracy, this fundamentally free world is exactly where Britain needs to be and exactly where British diplomats can add the most value and change the world. Fantastic. Tom, are you, are you is that conclusion of your remarks? It is. I'm happy thank to... You. Have the thank, you, thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, I wonder if I could... Um, uh, that sort of sets the, sets the broad stage on the, the direction of British foreign policy, the purposes of British foreign policy, the importance of new sorts of coalitions. Um, uh, I wonder if we could narrow down a little bit more into one particular instrument of British power, and that's defence and the military instrument. Um, uh, and uh, if in a minute I could ask Sir Michael Fallon, the former uh, Secretary of State for Defence, to come up and give his remarks. Um, Sir Michael, uh, I, I noticed, noticed with interest when your, your successor, Ben Wallace, was launching his uh, uh, the integrated operating concept last week, um, he, he, he was, uh, uh, some, there was some implicit criticism of past reviews. And of course, the last review was, was, was yours. Uh, and I wonder if you could say a word on what you make of these claims, that this will be the most far-reaching review since the end of the Cold War. But also, um, in more tangible terms, uh, the sense the previous reviews were not, were not um, uh, uh, bold or drastic enough in, in cutting what were called sunset capabilities by CDS, uh, the Chief of Defence Staff, and the Minister last week, uh, and in, in, in more substantially reshaping Britain's armed forces away from what Ben Wallace called mass, um, uh, you know, in other words, stuff, uh, towards agility and speed. Um, is, is, this, is there a danger of technology fetishism? Is there a danger of uh, putting all our eggs in, in, in unproven baskets, to mix metaphors, sorry, um, <laughs> but also in, uh, 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 in, in, in moving in, in too quick of a, of a radical direction? We'd be grateful for your views on this. Thank you. Well, Josh, you thank. And let me just make it very clear. I welcome this review. Uh, I welcome the fact it's uh, integrated, and especially the breadth and vision of the questions in the call for evidence that was issued in August. Now, speaking paternally, I think it is worth reminding ourselves that the last review was strategic. Um, and certainly integrated foreign policy with defense policy inaugurated an era of defense diplomacy, which I'm delighted to see the current Secretary of State for Defense uh, focusing on in, in a speech last month. And that review five years ago also put at its heart prosperity. Uh, and that, to my mind, is geoeconomic security. And that's really the first point I want to make today. We need to be better integrated, not just across government, but between government and industry and businesses. Because it is our economy in the end, our industries, that are under attack from our rivals and our enemies. Uh, they want to exploit our technology. They want to steal our intellectual property. They're penetrating our cyber defenses. They want to interdict our supply chains. So this would be my first big point for the integrated review. I hope it will focus very hard 
on what we need to do to defend our geo-economic security and better help British business to defend against disruption to their supply chains, uh, bans against uh, imports in a less multilateral world. And I hope we can therefore be more strategic about our use of export finance and credit guarantees. That's my first point. I haven't forgotten the two questions you've asked me, Joshi. My second point really uh, follows directly on from Tom, and I agree with all of it. It is, what should the scale of our ambition be? Uh, first, I think there has to be the near abroad. We have to focus on the immediate threat in the European Atlantic area, which comes still from Russian aggression, which comes still from terrorism. Al-Qaeda and Hezbollah have not been uh, defeated and still requires us to take a leadership role in NATO wherever we can. But beyond that, our reach, I think, should certainly exceed our grasp. We do need, I think, a more persistent presence in the most important economic region of all, that's Asia Pacific. And uh, we need to be honest about that, uh, not over-promising bases we can't afford, but working with key dem democratic allies, with Australia, with Japan, with India, to help keep the strategic waterways uh, clear and do what we can to reduce the threats. And some of that may well be what I call second order stuff, uh, doing more training and more exercising with our allies, not simply flag waving. So the level of our ambition, we have the opportunity now to stretch. And the third point, and this touches on your reference to capabilities. The last review got defense spending increasing again. That enabled us in 2015 to start closing some of the gaps that were left by the necessary uh, financial cuts of 2010 and enabled us to make more choices. And I hope in the same way, this review will enable us to make more choices about more investment in the new domains of cyber and space while retaining some of the capabilities, if not all of the platforms in some of the so-called sunset industries. And to do that, of course, it means the review must be fully funded. We're at present exceeding the 2% target, but I think we need to do better than that. Why? Because 20 years ago, before 9-11, before the terrorist attacks on London and Manchester and uh, elsewhere in Europe, before Russia went to war in the Crimea and, and the Donbass, before President Kim started firing missiles across the Korean Peninsula, before we had cyber attacks on our NHS and on our own parliament, before all that, 20 years ago, we were spending 2.7%. That would be at least seven or eight billion pounds a year more today. So in summary, I want to see a fully integrated review with Britain's economic security at its heart alongside physical security. I hope it will focus on the European Atlantic uh, area and leadership in NATO, but enable us too to be more often uh, in greater strength in Indo-Pacific. And I will hope it will be uh, uh, ambitious enough to help us promote our values abroad with democracies in the task of rebuilding a world rules-based order. And above all, I hope it's a review that is fully funded. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir Michael. Um, uh, some very succinct points there. Economic security, uh, a sense of honesty and realism about our potential role in Asia, including what you call second order activity, not just um, uh, large combat capabilities, but exercises uh, uh, and other sorts of engagement. And uh, investment in new domains, you said, while retaining some capability, but not necessarily platforms in the old domains. In other words, uh, it sounds like you, you, you accept the principle of trade-offs between these areas. In other words, the, the idea that to invest in cyber capabilities or space capabilities, there may be cuts to um, uh, platforms, uh, uh, numbers of uh, older assets. Uh, and that's something, of course, that I think we should, we should come back to in our discussion because uh, it's, a, it's a militarily significant point. It's also a very politically sensitive point. Anytime you start discussing cutting 
platforms, uh, things like tanks, things like uh, respective orders of um, F-35 aircraft. Um, I think given that this is an integrated review, we should also um, uh, uh, make sure we're covering all of these issues in the round. And I think this is a, the perfect time to have uh, um, remarks from Anne-Marie Trevelyan. Um, she is, of course, not only the former Secretary of State for International Development, uh, but also a former Minister for the Armed Forces. Um, so in some ways, about as integrated as, as ministers get, uh, and therefore very well placed to give us a perspective on all of this. Um, I hope you'll, you'll, you'll discuss how you see the integration of the... Uh, uh, um, um, of DFID and the Foreign Office, what implications do you think that has? Um, but also, if you could give us your thoughts on some, on some of my questions on the uh, apparent direction of the defence aspects of this review and whether you think that they are the, 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 um, uh, moving in a sensible direction or not. Uh, thank you, Shashank. I'll do my best uh, to answer that. Um, I will confess that having been very, very closely involved in the review until a few weeks ago, I've written some very specific words so that I don't accidentally tell you something that, of course, I shouldn't tell you just yet. Um, I'm new to this. Michael laughed when I told her this earlier on. But, of course, uh, there's a really interesting challenge to being at the heart of something so important and uh, coherent uh, and then suddenly being asked to talk about it uh, before it's been published. So you'll excuse me if I appear to dodge certain areas and share others with you. But I wanted to really set out that as we're leaving the EU and we're taking up our place as an independent country once again, the Prime Minister has been really determined that this is the time to halt those years of reduction in defence focus by government and indeed investment, as Michael raised, and to rekindle a really strong outward-facing internationalist policy which resets the UK's place in the world as that strongest and most reliable ally of the USA, and as the lead European nation in NATO, bringing military hard power and that wealth of expertise to the family of countries who stand together to protect our values of liberty and of freedom, and indeed to provide capabilities which allow us to reach the Asia-Pacific, where so much of this century's growth, economic development, and therefore potential new threats will come from. The PM is well known as an advocate of free societies and he's regaled us all over many decades with his comparisons with ancient civilizations, their rise, their fall, those who have defended freedoms and those who may not have. My classical education has always been definitely wanting, but the PM's regular sharing of ancient texts I think makes the point that humanity doesn't change really from millennium to millennium. The outcomes for citizens are determined by leaders willing to stand up and be counted, who use the tools at their disposal for the good of their people rather than to oppress. I've had on my desk since I was a teenager the words of Edmund Burke that the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is indeed for good men to do nothing. And I think the IR has challenged us to accept that we need to do once again differently and more to protect all that we hold dear. I think we have for too long allowed ourselves to accept that post-Berlin Wall so-called peace dividend as an excuse to reduce defence spending, to stop considering the resilience of our sovereign requirements from industry and to fool ourselves into forgetting that defence inflation in kit and in training terms always outstrips annual budget programming, leaving us vulnerable to nations investing in their people and equipment to steal a march on us. And we have seen that clearly from Russia and from China in recent years. Despite the challenges of hours and the day for the civil service managing the COVID crisis over the last few months, we have asked the difficult questions about where we really are and the IR about what we need to do to set the UK onto a new post-EU outward-facing credible path as a global leader across all strands of the security tools which government provides to protect its people. And it really has been all those tools. From the hard power military capabilities on land, sea and air to the new domains of cyber and space, our borders protections, trade ambitions and the security services who work unseen to understand our enemy's intentions. All of these have genuinely been brought together in this integrated review to set the UK's outward-facing security posture onto a stronger, more resilient, determined and impactful path. It has, as many will know, always been my view that as an island nation, our maritime capability is a critical part of our defence toolkit because the sea remains primary strategic medium of access and of exchange. That simple geography lesson reminds us that water covers 70% of our planet, 80% of the world's population lives by the sea, and an economics lesson will educate that 90% of goods are transported by ship, and 99% of the world's digital information is carried by sub-cables. It was indeed Policy Exchange who published the now transfer of the Exchequer's paper, Undersea Cables Indispensable but Insecure, back in 2017. That challenge remains and needs addressing.
The seas and the oceans above and below the surface link up the leading democracies of the world and indeed so many of those developing countries that as you ask the question, we in the new construct of FCDO want to be able to reach and partner with to help them to grow and be strong nations standing on their own two feet in future. We want to rely on the safety of all these waterways for our collective security, prosperity and connectivity. I'm very optimistic, perhaps I can say that with unreasonable knowledge, that this integrated review will draw together the new ge geopolitical focus towards the ASEAN nations and their growing economies, as well as thinking much more coherently about developing countries we want to support and be partners of the future in trade and in our liberal values. That determination that the Prime Minister continues to reiterate and it means absolutely to build those strong free societies. So to restore resilience to our maritime posture and capabilities, we'll need to bring together the other four domains of land, air, space and cyber to develop joined up transformative capabilities which make use of that British inventiveness, that creativity and the cohort of the extraordinary people who make up the defence and security family to maximise all their potential. And I think often untapped by those years of shrinkage, um, indeed, the three of our panellists today know too well the focus and energy that had to be taken to fight those battles in Iraq and Afghanistan. The key to success of the IR will be renewed and increased financial investment. Michael is absolutely right. And the direction to spend that in ways which builds credible and effective deterrence. If we get it right, then the tools and the training of our people will ensure that taxpayers' money provides resilience incredible deterrence, those critical elements of a successful long-term security framework for protecting our citizens, our values and our allies. Thank you very much. Um, Anri, before, you, before you, sit, you sit down, can I ask you just one follow-up on that? Mm. You talked about the a focus on uh, a geopolitical focus on ASEAN countries and, and on Asia. Um, I think there's a, there's a political question here, which is how do you explain to voters uh, who, who may not follow this very closely, what Britain's stake in putting military assets in Asia Pacific really is when you have large, powerful countries, uh, British naval power, significant as it may be, will not tip the balance in Asia. Um, there are hot spots all over Europe from the Eastern Mediterranean to the Caucasus to the Arctic. Um, what is it in, why is it really in Britain's interest to be putting its, its platforms and assets on the other side of the world? What is to be gained in hard national interest terms? How do you get that across? It comes back to the economic growth question and understanding where the 21st century growth is, where the potential for uh, populations to grow their countries in those liberal values, free societies, economic development, of which we will be beneficiaries, both in terms of uh, importing the goods they produce and indeed exporting our goods to those growing economies. So this feeds through, I mean, it, as, as uh, Secretary of State for Difford, I often use the example of, you know, why do, we, why do we invest money in developing countries? What's the point? You know, we've got our own problems here. Singapore used to be one of the, in the category of least developed country 50 years ago. Uh, countries invested, used donor money to help Singapore to grow. It's now one of the strongest and most successful countries in the world. Uh, if you use your, your tools, be it odour investment money, be it supporting countries with hard power, with security information, all those tools that our security uh, portfolio brings for those countries that you want to partner with, have strong trade and cultural relations with in the future, you have to lean in and support them because there are those around for whom the, that cultural environment, that freedom for the individual and for the community to live as they wish, uh, as we consider it in the West, uh, and indeed many, many other countries want uh, to be like that too. We have to support. If we believe in it, we have to be willing to lean in. And that's the key. So we need to have the hard power assets, the soft power assets, using our investment through ODA, if that's appropriate for some of those uh, younger, more developing countries. But it's critical that we lean in. If we want to be a credible global power speaking up for those values, that's what we must always do. So that's why the Prime Minister is absolutely... Uh, absolutely laser-like focus on making sure that we've got the tools to be able to do that. FCDO was, if you like, the first, first step in creating that coherent, clearer voice to speak on the world stage. Okay, thank you. Um, well, looking back at the last few weeks of the, um, uh, the MOD statements on the integrated review, uh, we've had briefings from the Chief of Defence Intelligence, Chief of Defence Staff, uh, the head of strategic command, the, the, the military's joint force, uh, and various other officials. And I think for me, as a journalist covering this, 
the single most common thread in all of these that I've seen has been the emphasis on non-traditional security challenges, threats in, in what the military has called the grey zone. So not above the threshold of open armed conflict, but both below and above it in the form of assassination, unmarked personnel, information warfare and, and other kinds of disinformation um, uh, uh, and various other sorts of unorthodox uh, um, uh, threats to the UK. Um, Paddy McGuinness uh, is a former Deputy National Security Advisor um, um, for security, uh, uh, security and resilience advisor, and has spent much of his has spent much of your career in the grey zone in some ways. And uh, so you're very well placed, I think, to give us a sense of um, uh, how you think uh, that aspect of the review will review will play out, and how in particular, in particular, I'm interested in is how the UK balances between grey zone threats of that kind. Uh, and traditional military threats, which are still absolutely active, as we have seen uh, in Ukraine, as we see uh, uh, this week in Nagorno-Karabakh with, with drones, artillery, warplanes. Um, and, and is there, in a sense, a trade-off between those two things uh, in terms of funds and investment that inevitably means we have to choose? Paddy. Well, thanks very much, Shashank. And thanks very much for the opportunity to contribute today. Um, I may have been in the grey zone, but I always knew exactly where I was and what I was doing. Let me stress that to start with. So, so I think in, in the past, in the previous three contributors, we've heard uh, a very clear balancing out of, of some of these issues in the sense of we heard from Amory and indeed from Tom, um, all of the aspiration and possibility that there is in the, at this juncture. Uh, as we um, as we leave the European Union, you know the the integrated operating concept, uh, a fuller role in the uh, Indo-Pacific, and indeed operating in five domains, including space and cyber, rather than the three and a half we have been arguably in in recent years, and to realise these, um, and, and to have the possibility of achieving what the Prime Minister and others have laid out. We've got to deal with some realities in a hard-headed way. I say hard-headed not to be pessimistic, but rather just to be really clear. And there was a hard-headed aspect, I thought, to what Sir Michael was saying. So to my mind, there are kind of four, three or four, maybe five realities we just need to have in mind. So the first one is that our place in the world, to a large extent, depends upon the stability and resilience of the homeland. And it was a bit concerning at the beginning of the integrated review that that aspect that was brought out so much in the 2010 and 2015 national security strategies didn't come through, the factor of resilience to all hazards and threats. I would have thought now, after seven months of the pandemic uh, and all that we faced as a result of it in terms of the economic and social impact, that there's a kind of fuller understanding of how important it is to be resilient as a nation and I do very much hope that the uh, inevitable review of perhaps restructuring of our approach to events such as these, which have such homeland impact, takes account of the national security significance of being able to absorb and deal with hazards and threats of all kinds. Because in the age of hybrid warfare, as you say, Shoshank, this is where the adversary attacks us. A second thing I'd say as regards this homeland aspect is that we should not forget law enforcement. This isn't an attempt to draw uh, the um, policing into the integrated review in its entirety, but it's undoubtedly true that we can be hollowed out by fraud, by uncontrolled immigration, uh, by cybercrime, and that these are exploited either exploited after the fact by an adversary, or actually, in the case of cyber, are actually a tool of the adversary. And law enforcement capability, with, with at least the technical competence that we've applied to counterterrorism, has the potential to, to stop our adversaries on or near the gain line. And that is something we should aspire to and take into account. Second point I'd make is something that Sir, uh, Sir Michael brought home so clearly. It's, it's great to have this aspiration to project east of Suez, profoundly east of Suez, but we've got to be really honest about what we've done in recent years and where we have made use of military force. And the reality is we've made use of it in our near abroad. We've, we've contributed to containing Russia 
uh, uh, in the North Sea and Atlantic, and we have had to mount counterterrorism operations predominantly in the Middle East and to shore up Europe. And we need to be really hard-minded about this. We have been through a period where there have been fewer terrorist attacks of huge scale, although this administration has had to deal with you know, two uh, terrorism-related stabbing events. Um, we haven't had the really major impact events. But, but this is because of suppressive action, um, suppressive military action and suppressive security and intelligence action, uh, and has the potential to come again. Uh, so we must maintain counterterrorism capability. And then one turns to Europe, uh, where, frankly, we were perhaps almost most affected uh, in the last period by uh, terrorism, once we got a grip on what was happening in Syria. And what we see in Europe is a chronic shortfall in security capability, and that the lessons of 2015-16 have not really been learned, and that the promised legislation, changes in powers, changing it, changes in organisation, just hasn't happened in member states in the way we might have hoped. And that leaves us with a near abroad that is vulnerable, vulnerable to terrorism, vulnerable to cyber. Um, and when one, when one looks at member states, uh, some of them protected by the deployment of British troops, one wonders a little bit why they aren't aligning with us more closely on the issues of access to data and to justice and home affairs tools, because those justice and home affairs tools are vital to the intelligence and law enforcement task that stops hybrid warfare and terrorism. And then the other aspect of the Middle East, where despite our best attempts, we continually get drawn back. And if we don't have a strategy for addressing the Middle East, uh, we won't be able to free ourselves and we won't be as free to operate in the world as we would hope. Some of that is about partnership, in particular with the regional states who we've encouraged to take on uh, the strain of this. Uh, and they sought to think Saudi Arabia and the UAE in uh, Yemen, think of what is happening in Libya. And finding a way of working with with them, deploying with them, operating with them in a slightly different way, I think is probably required if we're to deal with that. Thirdly, I'd say that discontinuity is vital. I thought that the US Congressional Task Force on these issues that I think reported last week was very telling in that many of the themes were the same as those we we're discussing here in the UK. Uh, and discontinuity is going to be vital. It is true that some sunset capabilities will have to be set aside. That's true in the United States. That's true here. But it's also true that if more money is going to be put into defence, we're going to have to have a different effect, a different approach and structure, different arrangements in place and a different management of that money because previous increased contributions to defence have not always achieved their desired outcome. You cannot put new wine into old wineskins. Fourthly, I think there's a really important continuity, a few really important continuities I'd like to emphasize, and some of them may surprise a little. I'm concerned we may be going at the hard power end of our um, foreign and uh, defense and security policy uh, in this review. And there are some aspects where we have technological advantage and indeed information advantage that we need to pull through. Now, personally, when I was uh, operating, leaning on um, aspects of resilience, I found the BBC problematic. And I found it problematic because I didn't find it to be a public service broadcaster when it came to resilience events. That was true during WannaCry. I'd explain that. It's certainly been true through this pandemic. But nonetheless, I find myself speaking up for the BBC and the aspect of the BBC that we don't sufficiently fund. And that is the provision of objective news in the world and in particular through the World Service. And I, I don't think it's quite clear to people just what a strength it is. I remember discussing it with John Brennan, the then head of the CIA. I said, what did you do? What do you do in the morning when you get up? And he said, the first thing I do is I look at the BBC online mm -hmm. to find out what is happening in the world with a degree of confidence. So there's something really important about the way we conceive of our soft power capabilities and how we fund and promote them and that isn't just pouring money into the BBC as it's currently constructed, but that is thinking about how we build on that. And then finally, I want to make a, uh, a link between this discussion and the legislative agenda, because there is in the legislative agenda a set of legislation coming through that is going to materially strengthen the tools that are available. 
That's true around foreign direct investment. That may be true around the internet, let us hope, and our ability to deal with big tech. And that that also uh, uh, will be um, true around counterterrorism tools, the protection of our uh, our armed forces. And, it, and it's vital that this legislation gets pulled through, and an espionage act, let me say. It's vital that this legislation gets pulled through. Otherwise, we will not have the tools to meet the aspirations. Thank you. Thank you for those very wide-ranging thoughts. Um, I think at the outset, on in, in the homeland aspect of this, you mentioned cybercrime. And I think that's a very sensible place for us to, to, to get into some of the cybersecurity discussions around this. Um, of the so-called sunrise capabilities that the review will, um, we are promised the review will address, um, cyber capabilities are high amongst them. The UK is, is uh, as we know, setting up a national cyber force um, uh, uh, between the Ministry of Defence and GCHQ, and cyber operations have been a major focus of the last several years. As we saw in 2016, uh, in the case of the US elections, some, some cyber operations can have big strategic effect on national level outcomes. Um, I, I just wanted to ask you uh, how you think UK cyber policy is developing, where you'd like to see it going, and how important um, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the offensive aspect of this is. And, and should it be something that is owned by the intelligence agencies, by the Ministry of Defence, between them? Is there an advantage to having it owned by multiple departments? Um, uh, how, do, how do you see that shaping up, um, Paddy? So, so I hesitate to talk in front of some articles because as we try to pick our way through this, uh, and he will have, uh, I know he has views on this and has good sense to offer us, so, so I don't want to kind of trample where he goes. Look, this is a vital area. Um, and uh, it isn't enough that we just um, take the baby steps forward from where we've got to. Uh, we need to drive uh, a real transformation. There are some really exciting elements in place from past work, but the job is far from done, far from done in terms of our, our defensive capability. And let's be clear about cyber. When you use offensive capabilities at scale, if you are not defended in the homeland, it won't go well for you and uh, um, systems as citizen depends on will be lost. So my perspective, I think, is, is that there is room for a uh, even greater energy and a tightening of the arrangements around both defensive and offensive cyber. It's taken a long time to get to the point where this force is coming into being. We're being slower than others, um, uh, and that's not good, so we need to press on that. I also think that um, there's some really interesting questions around uh, the governance of the arrangements, and this won't please many of my former colleagues, but I'll say it anyway. It does feel to me that just as in the United States, uh, the Department of Defense has a really decisive say uh, when it comes to the work of the National Security Agency. It does feel to me that in this area, if we're genuinely going to build into the fourth domain that is cyber, you know, there's going to have to be some really clear uh, uh, lines of accountability and resource that are going to mean that we have defence capability and not just intelligence capability in the cyberspace and defence with a big D, Ministry of Defence capability. And then finally, I think there are some really uh, challenging aspects around cybercrime that you raised. I, uh, I'm, I am now out of government and, and do a range of business uh, supporting listed companies as they deal with resilience problems. One of the ones they deal with is cyber intrusions and attacks and ransomware. There is a pandemic of ransomware in the world, 2019, 2020. And the state, including the British state, just doesn't have the tools to deal with it. And there is an interplay between those who are acting and adversaries such as the Russian state. And those two things taken together means that we really should get serious in that space and have energy. And I hope for that from the new leadership of the National Cyber Security Center. Thanks, Paddy. Can I invite Sir Michael and then any of the other panellists who wish to address this um, to pick up that point, please? Well, thanks, uh, Shashank. Not much more to add to that. So far as governance is concerned, uh, this all gets very theoretical. But clearly, for use of offensive cyber, uh, Ministry of Defence absolutely has to lead. And we shouldn't be confused about that in, in any way. Uh, I was always a little wary about completely separate cyber command. Uh, I didn't want the other commands to sort of contract out cyber, but maybe we're feeling our way now to the right kind of uh, compromise. And in terms of scale, I think we do have to, s to step up. I think we've done quite a bit to protect the machinery of government, 
a bit to protect critical national infrastructure. But it's the rest of the space out there, it seems to me, there are still, still huge gaps and, and, a much, uh, and plenty of space for the, for the National uh, Cybersecurity Centre to occupy. Thank you. Um, can I, there's, there's one um, aspect uh, uh, of the integrated operating concept, this, this new British, British Armed Forces way of thinking about war that jumped out at me, which, which touches on cyber, but also touches on lots of other things. Um, and that was a question of, of the, the, the rules and the laws governing the world and how they are changing or being stressed. Um, and, and the concept says the, the pace of technological change and the blurring of peace and war means that our legal, ethical and moral framework needs updating. Um, and that's a, a fascinating sentence with, 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 which could have lots of possible meanings. Tom, can I invite you and then, then Anne-Marie to give me your sense of, first of all, whether you agree with that, and secondly, in practice, what does that mean for you? Well, I, given that I didn't write it and I haven't seen the context, I'm afraid I have no idea what it means. Sorry, I should let me say one other line of elaboration in that case. This, I think, is in the context of um, uh, uh, adversaries uh, like Russia and China um, uh, in, in the, uh, uh, showing less adherence to, less respect for, a greater willingness to bend uh, international law, including the law of armed conflict and, uh, and international humanitarian law. Uh, and the, the concept says, although uh, uh, this is still something we should protect, um, uh, this legal and ethical framework in the context of this broad stress on international law and the laws of war in particular uh, needs, needs updating, and, and it leaves it at that. So it's, it's quite a sort of vague, open-ended uh, idea, but I think it, 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 it's, uh, it's something, something that's worth exploring in a bit more detail. Shoshan, you'll know that the first thing I did when I left the army was write a policy paper for, indeed, policy exchange <laughs> on the fog of law. And that was about the application of law in combat. And the point about it is not that uh, combat should be lawless completely, and certainly not that British soldiers and British sailors and airmen should be operating without uh, an ethical and legal uh, underpinning, but that that legal underpinning should be appropriate to the task in hand. We shouldn't treat, for example, those who had to storm the beaches at Normandy in the same way as we treat uh, those who have to uh, guard a warehouse, for example, in uh, Tunbridge. It would be inappropriate. What we're looking for, therefore, today is to look at the legal underpinning and to see what are the appropriate laws to apply. Now, what Paddy raised there, actually, was quite interesting because Paddy went into quite a lot of different areas of law that could uh, be brought in. And one of the areas, in fact, that the current Defence Secretary did an awful lot of work on when he was Security Minister was, of course, unexplained wealth orders. Mm -hmm. And this is about looking at how we use the law to defend our national security. Now, you'll know, Shashank, that I've been working through the Foreign Affairs Committee on uh, trying to do my best to expose and uh, 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 the dirty money that is in, in the City of London and, indeed, in many other jurisdictions because these are fundamental national security challenges. So I would argue very strongly that the rule of law and the application of the law is exactly what we need to see to defend our country against uh, those nations that seek to undermine it. Anne-Marie, did you want to follow up on that at all? I think, I think um, Tom says that I will. I think there's a, there's a really interesting point in there's, you know, you raised the question of does this sound like we're slipping into some, you know, lesser legal framework in order that we can you know, have a go. And I don't think that's, that's it at all. But there's a really, there's a fundamental challenge. You know, in, in our nuclear space, we, we don't have a first strike policy for very clear reasons. But we do have a very, you know, clear view that if someone had a go at us, we would, you know, be uh, able to feel within our own legal framework in defence of our people uh, to, to follow through. I think checking and reasserting whether the legal frames we have are actually placed so that we protect those we ask to go and do in possibly difficult jobs, be they in the invisible spaces that Paddy has worked in uh, and our cyber security spaces, our security forces, or indeed our soldiers, soldiers, airmen out front, uh, or indeed our ambassadors taking on the challenges of diplomatic activity in countries who are under all sorts of pressures from uh, China or Russia. I think these are, we have to be really certain that we've got the right tools for those people we ask to do those jobs uh, to make sure that they can do them with the absolute certainty that they're doing it the right way for the British government to be supporting them. Perhaps, could I add just one thing, Shashanki? I know you want to get on. I mean, there are two uh, areas, I think, that already confront us where the legal framework is simply out of date now. The first is the definition of imminence. Uh, we had to agonise in authorising strikes against Daesh as to just how imminent the threat mm -hmm. 
to us in the West, in Europe or in London actually was. And that was something that uh, in the end we ended up stretching uh, as far as it could and probably beyond what the actual definition of imminence was, knowing always that if you didn't take action against a particular terrorist threat, you could end up with a, with a serious uh, explosion or whatever, loss of life in, uh, in uh, one of the European cities when you knew you could have prevented it. And the second area, of course, is the increasing use by countries like Russia of not just paramilitaries but private armies of people who are simply operating uh, virtually as private citizens, have been paid as, paid as mercenaries to go into areas like uh, Libya, and where, again, the current legal framework, I think, really does need adjusting. So I think whoever wrote that particular sentence, um, and perhaps we haven't quite got to the bottom of where that came from, whether it was Nick Carter's speech or whatever, but clearly the legal framework does need adjusting. Thanks, thanks, Michael. So just to clarify, that was from the Integrated Operating Concept published um, by, by, I presume, the Ministry of Defence, uh, that line, and yeah. um, I'm sure I can tweet it later on for anyone who wants to look Good. more into that. Um, there have been a number of questions around coalitions, which was a theme of Tom's opening remarks. Um, questions on, could Canada, uh, New Zealand, UK be a third pillar on the world stage? Uh, there's questions on the Five Eyes. Uh, there's questions about should, should we work with the USA to create an Asian NATO? Um, and I think what these questions all get at is a sense of flux in coalitions. That of course NATO is is central, but there are it's true lots of new coalitions in the defence space and the non-defence space turning up in Asia. Uh, um, for example, um, uh, I spend a lot of time looking at the Quad: US, Japan, Australia, India. Um, uh, but of course, in cyberspace and other areas, there will be other sets of countries um, that are emerging in that context. I wonder if we have a sense of how we prioritise between these when we diversify. And I think the European ones are important here as well. Um, we're seeing, you know, the UK has signed up to the European Intervention Initiative, the French-led project. But there are other European defence and defence industrial projects that the UK may have an interest in, in keeping a presence in, in whatever fashion it's able to. Um, so perhaps, Paddy, bring, beginning with you and then moving on to the others, um, uh, in, in the areas that you know, um, uh, what are the sorts of coalitions that you see turning up that the UK should be leading or being part of? And which countries are the ones we should be focusing on here, perhaps particularly countries we don't spend enough time thinking about in this context? So... Um... So I think it's uh, it's important to recognise that uh, formal coalition, of course, um, uh, tends to require uh, uh, a, a a concerted problem you're applying yourself to. So you know, if you're confronting the Soviet Union, building a, a, a coalition with all that it entails is straightforward. In the current more fluid world, I think there's a kind of second tier, a second layer, an operating layer, perhaps. Uh, where we need to be working, which is where we've got the arrangements, the relationships, the interaction in place to be able to put together the right coalition to deal with a particular problem at pace when that problem emerges, because we've got such diverse problems coming to us. Um, and so that, and that, that um, I thought the integrated operating concept allowed for that, because if one is operating more in the world, is deploying more, is re retaining less contingent capability. One has more interactions, one has more skin in the game. And frankly, the same is true in the intel intelligence arena, intelligence and security arena. And it has been a feature of our agencies, and in particular MI5 and of the police service, that we've had a set of relationships, they've maintained a set of relationships, and it isn't always transactional uh, um, uh, in, in individual interactions, but actually you can build out from them when you need it to put together the right combination of partnerships. And I think that kind of, dare I say, contingent capability in the law enforcement and intelligence space is really valuable. And then the other one to say is where we have definite national advantage, um, uh, we should uh, use it to maximum effect to build those relationships. That's certainly true in cyber obviously elements of military power, um, some elements of the in, in, in intelligence thing, but also in some strange areas such as, uh, well, not strange, but uh, nuclear, uh, civil nuclear capability, where there's some really interesting problems in the world as Russian and Chinese technology becomes the dominant form of civil nuclear being built on uh, 
in foreign states. And there is something to be done there in terms of exploiting our natural advantage. Thank you. Can I go to our physical panel for whoever might want to take that thought up? Shoshan, can I pick it up and just say, look, I think the, the idea of variable geometry here in what have formerly been static alliances is exactly what we should be uh, leaning into. The reality is that the fixed uh, description of states within uh, solid alliances that have not moved in reality for 40, 50, 60 years, it's changing. And it's changing for the very obvious reasons that the dynamics that underpin those alliances are changing. We no longer have the Cold War to keep us fixed into a European static NATO. We no longer have uh, the World Trade Organization being unchallenged to keep us into a fixed static WTO. Now, that doesn't mean that I argue that we should leave either of them. Indeed, I think that we should build on both. But what we do also need to look at is how do we make more variable alliances? And I touched on a few earlier for democratic powers, for trade powers, for environmental powers. You may also look at, you know, building on the FPDA, the Five Party Defense Agreement in uh, the South Pacific, or building into the Quad, or indeed expanding the Five Eyes, as I've spoken about with the Japanese defense minister, well, as was, he's now the Japanese cabinet minister, um, who is a very big and passionate supporter of getting Japan into the so-called six sides. So all of this works together in seeing how do we look again at this framework? How do we challenge ourselves to work with partners in different ways? And of course, Kanzuk, as the, as the line goes, is important. Of course, it's important. But in a way, that's low-hanging fruit. What we really need to do is to build off that and be much more ambitious. Anne-Marie, please. Thank you. I think Tom raises a really important point, that this question of uh, other, other groupings and the one he raises, particularly his E80, the environmental questions, resource management uh, and uh, making sure that resources are not abused uh, by those nations uh, who want to have control through that uh, is really important. So looking at the work we did uh, through DFID and now the FTDO and understanding those developing countries that are at risk of being, in my view, abused by the likes uh, of China who want to asset strip uh, and have control and gain huge potential military advantage where they want to use it is really important. Building, understanding that the challenges of climate change, the management of water, uh, the risks to uh, so many states that are at sea level... Um, we have to understand that those relationships are critically important. They're about non-military things at the moment, but if those relationships aren't strong and something goes wrong, we have to have those relationships. And we absolutely, as Paddy said, have a global advantage in that space. We are world-leading both in our technology, in our understanding, indeed even in our legal frameworks, to drive forwards understanding those critical resource management issues and supporting countries who would otherwise potentially be exposed to the abusive behaviour of those uh, bullying nations? Well, I think we've got to be, um, if I may, much more flexible about this, as Tom, uh, as Tom has said. And if you believe, you know, we should still be in fixed alliances, remember what happened in the Strait of Hormuz. Mm. The first ship to come and help us there was Australian. It wasn't any of the Europeans. Um, the coalitions you know, uh, aren't, aren't easy things. Uh, they involve not just common interests, but they involve trust. Trust over landing rights, berthing rights, weapons use, and so on, and they take time to build up. I think the biggest opportunity for us to do this is in Indo-Pacific, as I think uh, Tom has already said. In fact, in the 2015 review, we specifically upgraded, if you like, or highlighted the potential of a better alliance with Australia, a better alliance with Japan, and a stronger alliance with, uh, with India, because so many of the bilateral relationships in Indo-Pacific are so poor. I think there's a real opportunity there for the democracies uh, there to, to, to work together. So that's certainly one area which I think we need to be more forward-thinking and more flexible. Thank you. Can I can I just end? Uh, we have two minutes left, so we're just drawing to a close. But if I could end with a very simple question, um, which is uh, for all of you, perhaps, um, are there is there a country or are there countries, um, uh, peers, uh, uh, partners, even adversaries that you consider models or or, or, or um, that have acted impressively or adaptably in changing the way they do? foreign security and defence policy, changing their armed forces, moving in a more agile direction, working effectively. Um, I, th I think that I find this an interesting question because, you know, we're a, we're a, we're a medium power looking for, uh, without the luxury of resources of a, of a superpower, but also with aspirations greater than the small power. So 
Are there any other countries that you think we should be looking at that have succeeded in one or, or one or all of these areas um, that stand out? And perhaps we could uh, go in the order that we, we went through our remarks in. Tom? Uh, yeah, very briefly, I think Estonia has done brilliantly in reorganising itself as a cyber defence uh, powerhouse. And the other Baltic states have worked incredibly impressively to create a NATO counter-information warfare uh, department that is really keeping us all safe. Thank you. Sir Michael? Well, the, the Baltic, not just the Baltic states, but the poor, some of the poorest states of uh, NATO, the Bulgarians and Romanians, have made huge efforts to increase their defence expenditure. Some of the Scandinavian countries, I think, have a lot to teach us about, uh, about uh, resilience. And, um, and uh, you know, yet again, uh, you see in some of the technologies, you see Israel leading the way. So those are three areas, certainly, I would look at. Thank you. Anne-Marie? Um, I think I would agree with Michael that the way the Scandinavian states uh, work, work, co work coherently together and indeed uh, develop their particular specialisms is something that is, is to be uh, both praised and uh, thought through very carefully in how we drive forward those particular new areas, particularly in space and cyber, that we want to build on um, to be uh, world leading with, but to really think through where are both industry and you know, human, human capital talent lies so we make sure we make best use of it. Thank you. Uh, Paddy, would you like to round us off? Sure. I mean, I think I'm going to use two, and forgive me for this, but I can't resist it. So one of them is Russia. Mm. Uh, and Russia, not uh, obviously in terms of our, its values or indeed its soft power capability, which it doesn't have in the way that we do, and therefore we could do much more than it, but in the way in which it's, it's made such use of a limited military budget, broadly equivalent to ours, and got such a return and has been quite agile. Now, lots of things wrong with Russia, but it's quite an interesting kind of um, salutary lesson for us when we see what can be done with equivalent resource. Um, so care is needed there. And the other one I think that's really interesting is China. And the reason China is interesting is that I think when they realized our phenomenal lead in the cyber domain, they got busy. Uh, and as a result, we have what we have now. So when they saw the Snowden revelations and the like, my word, they got busy. Seeing what China is doing now to us and other states too, look at the World Health Organization being hacked by a group that appears to be Vietnamese during the pandemic, we should get busy and take a lesson from them. Not that I wouldn't disagree with all what all the other panelists have said about the Baltic states and Sweden, absolutely. But there is something about our adversaries and what they've learned from us. Thank you. So you're, you're not suggesting an investment in Novichok, but you are suggesting uh, um, agility and, and a careful understanding of your rivals. Thank you very much. I won't try and sum up all those points. We've had far too many interesting points, but um, I think we all look uh, eagerly forward to the integrated review and how far it bears out our discussion. Thank you all uh, to the panel and thank you all for attending and look forward to seeing you at one of these very soon. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.